In this video, we're going to take a look at the basics of truth tables, how to construct them, and what it is that they're representing to us. Let's turn to it. In talking about truth tables, I want to start by examining the reference columns. So suppose we want to do the truth table for the sentence negation P. That is, we want to know under what conditions negation P is true and under what conditions negation P is false. What we do in the reference columns is we find how many types of atomic statements that we have. In that case, this will be P. And we put that in our reference column. And then what we do with our reference columns is we figure out all the combinations of the truth values for the statements that are in the reference column. Well, in this case, we only have one statement, and a statement can be true or false. So what we do... is we create two rows, one in which P is true and one in which P is false. And each of these rows is merely representing to us a situation in which P turns out to be true and a situation in which P turns out to be false. So for instance, if P is the statement the grass is green, and so we have a situation, situation one, the grass is green. So if the grass is green and we say that the grass is green, of course, it's true. Situation two represents a situation in which the grass isn't green. Maybe somebody came by and sprayed, uh, spray painted it this color. In which case, it's false that the grass is green. So let's expand on this. Let's say this is the sentence that we want to make a truth table for. Well, in this sentence, I see that I actually have two types of atomic statements. P's and Q's. So I can't just have a P in my reference column if I'm going to be able to get all the truth combinations for the P's and the Q's. Instead, I need both of the P and the Q in the reference column. So we know that one case is for Q to be true, and another case is for Q to be false. And we know the very same thing about P, that P could be true and that P could be false. The problem is, if I simply receive, um, if I simply repeat the pattern that we did with Q, and then I end at two rows, that's not going to get all of the truth combinations. It only gets two combinations, two of the possible combinations. It gets the case in which P is true and Q is true, and a case in which P is false and Q is false. But P could be true when Q is false, and P could be false when Q is true. And it leaves out those situations. So, To make sure that we get all of the combinations, since we know that this exhausts all of the possible combinations for Q, then if we put T and T here, we know it exhausts all the combinations for Q when P is true. But wait a second. We know that P could be false as well. But if we just repeat 
the true and false, the very same pattern that we have here, again, we've exhausted the combinations for Q, but now we're pairing it with the false instead of the true, and that lets us know that it covers all of our bases. So row 1 covers the case in which P is true and Q is true. Row 2 covers the case in which P is true and Q is false. 3 covers the case in which P is false and Q is true. And 4 covers the case in which P is false and Q is false. So um, it's representing those cases in the abstract, but we can make that a little bit more concrete to ourselves. So if we were to suppose that P is just the statement the grass is green, <clears throat> and if we suppose that Q is just the statement that the fire hydrant is red, then situation one is this case. Our grass is green. And our fire hydrant is red. Case two is this case. Our grass is green. Our fire hydrant is not red. Case three. Our grass is not green, and our fire hydrant is red. In case four, our grass is not green, nor is our fire hydrant red. Right, because if P is telling us that the grass is green and it's true, then it better be that the grass is actually green. If Q says that the fire hydrant is red, then our fire hydrant better be red. Again, the grass better be green if P is true. If Q is false, it means that our fire hydrant needs to be some other color than red. It doesn't have to be yellow, it just needs to be not red. This tells us that the grass better not be green. Fire hydrant better be red, better not be green, better not be red. All right, so for one more time, let's make this sentence we're doing a true table on slightly more complicated. So let's say this is the sentence that we want to examine now. Okay, one of the reasons why I wanted to make, uh, to examine this more complicated sentence is because now we have two instances of P. Of course, P says the same statement. So, for instance, grass is green. And since it's saying the same statement, it's going to, be in, it's going to end up being true or false under the same situations. And for that reason, instead of putting two P's in our reference column, we only need one P. And it covers both of the P's that we see in our sentence. All right, so then we have Q. And we have R. So again, we know that R can either be true or false. And we also know that Q can be true or false. In order to capture all of the combinations um, that can occur between Q and R, we can rely on this pattern. But of course, with adding P into the picture, P can also be true or false. Well, we know we can cover all of our bases
if we put first nothing but T's with this combination between Q and R in the blue box. Because those are all the times that Q, all the combinations that Q and R can take with all the cases in which P are true. So if I just repeat the combination that's in the blue box, I again know that this covers all the combinations that Q and R can take in terms of their truth combinations. So if I now add, instead of truths for the P, falses, I know that these four truths give P the, the um, truth value true for all the combinations that Q and R can take, and this gives us false for P in all the combinations that Q and R can take. So again, it just covers all of our bases. So there is a more general pattern that is taking place here that I want to elaborate on. When we're only dealing with one atomic sentence, we only needed two rows because there were only two situations to worry about, namely when R was true or when R was false. But when we had to worry about two atomic sentences, then we had to worry about all the truth combinations that could take place between Q and R. So we had to account for the fact that Q could be true when R is true and false, and that it can be false when R is true or false. And then that caused us to have to add two more rows to account for two more possible situations. It doubled how many rows that we had to have, and that's because truth can take two values, true or false. Then we saw again when we were worried about three atomic sentences, we had to worry about all the cases for P when it was true for all the combinations that Q and R could take, but all the, also we had to worry about when P was false for all the combinations for when Q or R could take place. And that forced us to add more rows to account for all those situations. That is, and if you'll notice, it's been doubling each time. Went from two to four to eight. And it turns out that pattern, in order to cover all the truth combinations, that pattern um, continues. And so we can determine the number of rows needed in a truth table by taking two to the power of n, where n is equal to the number of atomic sentences in our reference column. Or how many number of atomics, how many number of type of atomic sentences that are found in the sentence that we're doing the truth table on. So this will tell you how many rows you're going to need for a truth table. Are you going to need two? Two to the one if you only have one atomic statement. 
are you going to need 4, 2 to the second power? If you have two atomic statements, are you going to need 8? If you have 3, because 2 to the third power is 8. If you have a fourth one, then that's 2 to the fourth power. It's 16, and it just keeps doubling. So 16, 32, 64, 128, so on and so forth. So this also gives us a mechanical process such that as long as we follow it, it'll guarantee that we've captured all the truth combinations of the um, atomic sentences that are in question here, P, Q, and R. So the first step then is to figure out how many rows that we need. We said that was 2 to the N, where N was equal to the number of atomic sentences that's needed for our reference column. Well here, because it's P, Q, and R, N equals 3. So 2 to the third power equals 8. So that means we know that we need 8 rows. So the next step in this mechanical process is to start with the proposition that is next to our vertical line. And the pattern that it takes, no matter how many rows that we have, is just TF, TF, TF. So we do the TF, TF pattern for eight rows. T, F, T, F, T, F, T, F. So then moving left to the next proposition, we just double that pattern. So instead of TF, we go T, T, F, F. So for Q, we get T, T, F, F. We have to do this pattern for how many rows that we need, in this case, eight. And then we just, as we continue moving left, we just keep doubling the pattern. And you do that for however many atomic sentences that we have. In this case, we have three, so P will be our last one. And it'll get T, 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 F, 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 F. All right, so one of the things that you'll notice then is your most outer atomic sentence. It should be the case that the first half of the rows is T, and the second half of the rows should be Fs. So as long as you stick to that pattern, no matter how many atomic sentences there are, it'll ensure that you've captured all the truth combinations that can take place between them. All right, so I want to end this video by giving you a sense about one of the things that truth tables can do for us, which is to represent the truth conditions of complex sentences, uh, specifically those complex sentences that are connected by the logical connectives, negation, conjunction, disjunction, material conditional, um, and biconditional. So I want to just use two relatively simple complex sentences. Negation Q, which means not Q or it's not the case Q. And P conjunction Q, which says P and Q. So let's look at not the case Q first. If you think about what not the case Q is saying, it's saying that Q is false. Now, if I say Q is false, I'm correct only when Q actually is false. So in those cases, since I would be correct, they get the value true. So in situation two and four, this statement is true. Now, if I say that Q is false, that Q is actually true, then what I'm saying is wrong. So it deserves the value or gets the value false in one and three. 
So this gives us the truth conditions for not the case Q. Uh, really, since we only have one proposition, we really just needed to focus on um, two of the rows, one and two. Whenever uh, Q is true, not the case Q is false, and whenever Q is false, not the case Q is true. Or whatever sentence that Q happens to be. All right, so let's look at the conjunction then. P conjunction Q, meaning P and Q, what it is asserting is that both P and Q are true. Well, there's only one situation in which both P and Q turn out to be true. That's situation one. In all of the other situations, to say both P and Q will be incorrect because at least one of P or Q ends up being false. So the only situation in which P and Q is correct is in one. They're both true in that case. But Q is false here, so P and Q, the whole sentence, P, the conjunction P and Q is false. P is false, so the conjunction P and Q is false. And they're both false in four, so P and Q is false. All right, hopefully that gave you a sense about how truth tables can reveal to us the truth conditions of complex sentences. But if it seemed a little too fast, I don't want you to worry yet, because in future videos we'll have a chance to discuss truth conditions using truth tables in much more detail. All right, that wraps up this video on the basics of truth tables. I hope it was informative.